Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Give us one hour and we'll help you change the way you think about happiness. Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. Each week, Lisa spotlights diverse trendsetters and change agents who are the greatest contemporary thinkers and doers, devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. Your host, Lisa Cypress Kamen, is a widely recognized applied positive psychology expert, author, documentary filmmaker, and lecturer specializing in optimal lifestyle management. Let's get to it. Here's Lisa. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining us on today's show, where you will learn how to redefine spiritual practice. This is for skeptics and seekers. We're going to contemplate ethics, evolution, and the divine. My first guest is Rabbi Wayne Dosick. Ho, ho, ho. Before we get started, I want to remind you all that there's nothing like a good love story to make us happy. This season, discover your holiday love story with Audible. Listen to exclusive stories, original podcasts, and more. Enjoy brand new Audible originals like Hold Me Closer, Tony Danzig, and There's Something About Mary, and Christmas Podcast. Woof! Keep the fire going with romance favorites like Eight Winter Nights and Nick and Noel's Christmas Playlist. Tis the season to get cozy. Go to audible.com slash holiday romance. Listen now only from Audible. Now let's get on with today's episode. My guest today is Rabbi Wayne Dosick, who teaches and counsels about faith, ethical values, life transformations, and evolving human consciousness. He is the rabbi of the Elijah Minion, a retired visiting professor at the University of San Diego, and the host of the monthly internet radio program, Spirit Talk Live, heard on Healthy Life.net. He is the author of Radical Loving, One God, One World, one people. And Rabbi Wayne is in the house. Thanks for being with me today, Rabbi. Hey, great pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, It's a great pleasure. Let's talk about, you and I spoke briefly before we got started about how for some people, the G word can be a challenge and religion, perhaps in its most organized sense, can be a challenge. But this idea of spirituality and having connection to something greater than oneself is probably one of the roots of happiness. Well, it is. If people don't like organized religion, they should come to my synagogue. We're so disorganized that we would fit, they would fit right in. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're right. Uh, I, I'm, a, look, I'm a rabbi. I'm a practicing Jew. I taught for 17 years at the Catholic University here. I'm deeply into religious belief and practice. Uh, and I look at the world and I see that it is so well-reasoned and so well-arranged that for me, it can't be accidental or, or coincidental. So I call the creator of that universe and of me and of you, I call that God. Others are more comfortable calling a force or an energy or a light of the universe. And it's perfectly fine, whatever, whatever we do. The one difference is that a force or an energy or light does not necessarily have with it a, an ethical perspective. So God is, for me, not only the creator and the recreator and the maintainer, but God is also the source of the ethical values uh, and the ethical injunctions by which I live. And so God is not a neutral force in the universe. God, for me, is a Um, loving, decently kind, gracious, graceful creator and maintainer. And I would ask anyone who doesn't see it that way to understand, to try to understand where the unethical value system comes from if it doesn't come from the divine. Well, when, when we look at the title of your book, Radical Loving, One God, One World, One People, what I glean from that title and from actual, you know, context of the book is that you're talking about one source. That's correct. 
the the theme song of the world these days seems seems to be my god's better than your god <laughs> and if you don't believe me i'll force you to believe me or i'll terrorize you if you don't believe me uh the reality is that there is one god who is the one creator of us all and god says to us i created you i am your parent i love you all i don't play favorites I hope you will love me and I hope you will learn to love each other because we are all one family. We are all children of the universe and fighting and with each other over the slight differences in the way you call me or the way you approach me or the way you celebrate me or the way you curse me. Uh, those are all just simple physical manifestations. It is not the core depth of the spiritual relationship that we have. So let's jump to that spiritual relationship, because I think many listeners may question, you know, their their own faith or their own experience of spirituality, or perhaps they say it's never worked for me. So many bad things have happened in my life. How could there possibly be a God? Well, God is the everything of the everything. So if God is the everything of the everything, then everything is within God. So if you picture a beach ball, and this takes you back to my most recent book before this book, which is called The Real Name of God. But if you picture a beach ball, each and every one of the panels of the beach ball, the different colored panels of the beach ball, is one attribute or aspect or manifestation uh, or behavior of God. So there is, God is both male and female, good and evil, right and wrong. And so... God says, look at the panel of my beach ball that is the, the good one and choose that more than you choose evil. Choose the panel of my beach ball that is all inclusive and not and not exclusive. So everything, everything is of God. Every human being, this desk that I'm sitting at is of God. The rock, the tree, the whole universe is of God. Everything, everything, everything is of God. And when tragedy comes our way, as it will in every life, it's part of the ongoing process of the universe that God created. And instead of being mad at God, uh, the psalm says, out of the depths, call out to God, because God, in, in your discomfort and in your sadness or in your grief, God is weeping with you and ready to hold you and comfort you. I think that's very beautiful. And I think that there are also people who are skeptical, particularly now because there's so much war and strife and separation in the name of God. You know, that's the problem. That is the problem. That's exactly the problem, and that's the reason that I wrote this book. One God, one world, one people. So God says to us, stop fighting. Uh, stop uh, stop uh, being silly over a piece of land or another dollar in your treasury uh, or um, – uh, a bit of power or prestige in your area. Understand that you are all my children, and what happens to one of you happens to every one of you. So if there is one hungry person in this world, every person is hungry because we are all interconnected in that deep, deep way. But how do we communicate this to our fellow humanity. You you believe this. I may believe this. My neighbor might believe it. But then there's that guy across the street or that gal across the street that doesn't believe it. And the peace, you know, that, that notion of peace starts with us at the individual level. Yes, you're absolutely right. And I am, I've been called naive and I've been called idealistic and I've been called foolish and I've been called, you know, a 60s idealist. And the reality <laughs> is you're all right. You're but all those things. We're all those what's things. What's the alternative? The alternative has gotten us absolutely nowhere. The alternative has gotten us war and bloodshed, filled the earth with the blood of human beings, and filled the cemeteries of all our countries with the uh, flowers of our youth. What we have been doing up until now has not worked. And that's why everything, everything, everything is falling apart because the world cannot continue to move forward. What we call in spiritual terms from the 3D world to the 5D world, if we hang on with our fingernails to what has been. And that's why there's such fear and such fundamentalism because those who are comfortable with the old are very, very afraid 
of the new. So they hang on to the old with all they have. But the reality is we are moving into a new world, a world of enlightenment, a world of of um, goodness and kindness and decency and dignity. And the the sooner we move there, all of us will be so much better off. And so if this hasn't worked for you so far, my question is what has worked better? The answer, my answer is nothing. So you have nothing <laughs> to lose by trying this and coming along with me to a world of oneness consciousness. We are all one. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head about fear. And I think the fear is of, of change, right? That the world is radically changing because we have so much technology and information available to us and people are frightened of change. It's hard to change. Sure it is. And uh, therefore, um, the fundamentalists hang on and they say, do it my way because we've always done it this way. Do it my way because I'm most comfortable with this. Do it this way because uh, I don't know how to leap onto the unknown uh, without being afraid. And, um, you know, it, very interestingly, in the Bible, the, 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 the Jewish Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, the word in, in different grammatical forms, the phrase, do not be afraid, is used more than 300 times. Really? And that's because... We were all afraid. We yeah. respond to we talk about what we are responding to. So the only way, the only way to respond to fear and to anger and to hatred is through love. Love is the only thing that will cure, that will respond to uh, fear and hatred and bigotry and discrimination. It is reaching out one human being to another to understand that we are all one. And the way I see it is that we are all created in the image of God. And if I look into the mirror, not physically, of course, but spiritually, I see the face of God. And if I look at you, uh, if I look at you, then I see the face of God. And if you look at me, this is what the uh, Sanskrit means by namaste. Yes. Uh, the divine in me acknowledges, sees and divide, acknowledges the divine in you. And so if I look in the face of another being and I see the face of God, then my only response again is profound love. And this practice that you speak of, and I do think it's a practice because we, we don't do this 100% of the time, although many of us aspire to it, but that practice does create a softening in that story, you know, being able to do this practice is very spiritual, especially when it's somebody that we think we don't like. Sure. So on the simplest way, walk into the bank on Friday afternoon to make a quick deposit or get some cash for the weekend. And the line is 10 people long and the, cl the clerk is taking forever and you get angry and you get frustrated. Or you walk into a convenience store and the teenage clerk can't make change for a dollar bill without <laughs> using his calculator. Um, instead of being angry and frustrated at those in those situations, and these are the simplest of all situations, uh, that see the face of God in another human being, and maybe that person is struggling with an issue that day, or doesn't know how to make a change for a dollar bill, or is doing her very best, but the person in, in front of you in line is asking for 12 different transactions at the bank that day. Look at that person the way you would like to be looked at, with some compassion, you know, compassion, the word compassion means walking with another in equal step. And so walk with another in equal step and walk with someone who is in pain or who has a need or um, even something you don't understand. I'll tell you a quick story, if I may. Let's take a break and then you can tell me the quick story because we need to take a pause. We're going to come back. We're going to take that pause and then we're going to return to the conversation with Rabbi Wayne Dosick to learn more about Rabbi's work and his books, particularly Radical Loving, One God, One World, One People. Please visit ElijahMinion.com slash Rabbi Wayne. Here comes the pause. We'll be right back. And that is guarantee. Just a little minute here before we pause, I want to talk about the happiness of good hair days. Let's face it, there is no such thing as a one size fits all solution for fabulous hair. One product that works well for curls 
might make fine hair limp and dull, and so on and so on. And if hormonal changes are giving you bad hair days, join the club. But thanks to our proud partner pros, I have a personalized hair care routine that has made me one happy camper with fabulous hair. Pros makes custom hair care that effectively targets your tresses with natural ingredients tailored to your needs with proven results. I got started with pros by taking the easy peasy online consultation that asks real world lifestyle questions about daily habits such as nutrition, exercise, life stressors, hair care habits, and more. Pros even asked me about where I live to learn about things like weather and humidity. Next up, pros analyzed all the answers and determined a unique hair care prescription of products to match my hair and scalp plus goals for lovelier locks. All Pro's products are sustainably sourced, ethically gathered, and cruelty-free. My custom blended hair care plan includes a pre-shampoo mask, shampoo conditioner, and root source hair supplements designed to give me a fuller, stronger, silky smooth, happier head of hair. And if you're not 100% positive Pro's is the best hair care you've had, they will take the products back, no questions asked. Pretty impressive, eh? Pros is a carbon neutral certified B corporation and an industry leader in clean and responsible beauty products. Pros is the healthy hair regimen with your name all over it. Take your free in-depth hair consultation and get 15% off your first order today. Go to pros.com slash happiness. That's pros dot com slash happiness for your free in-depth hair consultation and 15% off. Now let's take that pause. We'll be right back. To learn more about cultivating sustainable well-being at home and the office, visit HarvestingHappiness.com and explore Lisa's experiential on-site brain fitness workshops, corporate programming, and speaking engagement services. And we're back. But before we get back to it, let's talk about the importance of our homes being a place that brings as much joy as possible. Home should be a hub for happiness. That's a canvas for connection and memory making. And these days, home is our haven doing double duty as a hybrid castle, sanctuary, office, gym, workshop, recording studio, boardroom, creativity laboratory, and base camp hangout. Home is where I get to express myself as a designer and host good times. Get your home holiday prepared for celebration. Get ready for Joybird's holiday sale. Joybird offers crisp, modern, customizable furnishings and accessories for every space. Joybird is furniture that fits your style in a wide variety of vibrant and durable designs. Don't know where to start? Joybird's design specialists are standing by to help make your vision a reality. You can even book a virtual showroom appointment and order a fabric swatch kit all for free. Ordering online has never been easier or more fun. From design to customer care, Joybird has you covered. Joybird Furniture stands by its quality and craftsmanship. If it's not everything you'd hope for, send it back within 90 days. Each piece is made with incredible care using responsibly sourced materials that are free of harmful chemicals. Joybird is also committed to a more sustainable future by partnering with groups like One Tree Planted to help conserve and restore Earth's precious natural resources. Simply put, Joybird Furniture is made with top-notch stain and scratch-resistant fabrics and comes with a limited lifetime warranty. Joybird Furniture can handle anything your family throws at it, literally. Create a space that brings you joy with Joybird. Visit joybird.com slash happiness and get 30% off your purchase. That's 30% off at joybird.com slash happiness. Now let's get back to it. And we're back, continuing the conversation about spiritual practice for both skeptics and seekers. We're contemplating ethics, evolution, and the divine. Let's get back to my conversation with Rabbi Wayne Dosick. So Rabbi Wayne, I cut you off when you were about to tell a story, and that's probably not a good thing to do to a rabbi, so take it away. <laughs> <laughs> well, as a radio host, I know when the segue to break comes, so I was, uh, I was gonna, uh, And before we uh, tell you the story, let me offer an, an additional website, about this book in particular, it's called RadicalLovingBook.com. Perfect. So you can find out much, much more about the, the, this book on that website. So when my kids were little, they're old now, uh, we tried to put into effect an ancient practice in modern times. 
It is said of an ancient sage that when he wanted, when he went to the market, if he needed a, a piece of meat, he would buy two. If he needed a bunch of vegetables, he would buy two, one for himself and one for the hungry in his neighborhood. So we translated that into modern times by saying every time we went to the market, we would buy one extra item of non-perishable food, uh, a box of cereal, a box of mac and cheese, a can of tuna fish, a, a jar of peanut butter, a jar of jelly. And we wouldn't even take it into the house. We would leave it in the grocery sacks in the trunks of the car. And when we collected two or three or four bags, we would take it to the local food pantry. Well, I'm in the store one day with uh, my son, who was about five at the time. He's in his late 40s now, so it's an old story, but it's so true. And I took a box of cereal from the shelf, and I said to him, honey, how about this as our food gift today? And um, he looked at me and said, no, and grabbed the box of cereal off from my hands, put it back on the shelf, stood on his little tippy toes, and took a different box of cereal from the shelves. And he said, look, Dad, this will be our food gift for today. And I said to him, honey, what's the difference? And he said, look, there are hungry kids out there, too, and kids like sugar frosted flakes better than we like Cheerios. <laughs> now, in an instant, in an instant, that child taught me to see not a category of people, the hungry, the poor, the homeless, the needy, but he taught me to see the face of a child, probably his age, whom we were helping to not be so hungry by our food gift that week. And so when we look into the face of another, if we see the face of God, we then meet the needs of that person as well. Well, let's talk about that face of God. First of all, I want to just uh, talk about the power of giving, you know, what it means to actually to give, you know, to give from the heart to a cause or to people or to a group, it does cause personal elevation as well as doing good. So if we're talking about harvesting happiness, certainly the idea of doing good for somebody else truly matters. But I want to jump back to the face of God, because you mentioned something in the first segment about God as a man, God as a woman. And this is not something that you often hear from religious leaders. And it's a bit of a, a bit of a spin here, because what does God really look like? God doesn't look like anything. God is a spirit, a force. If I knew what God looked like, yeah, I'm reminded of the story that the, the the teacher told the kids, that the kindergarten kids, they could draw anything they wanted, take a piece of paper and some crayons. So she walked around, and one kid was drawing a rainbow, and one kid was drawing his puppy, and one kid was drawing her house. And she came to little Susie, and she said, Susie, uh, tell me about your picture. She didn't understand. She said, I'm drawing a picture of God. Susie, the teacher said, Susie, nobody knows what God looks like. She said, after in five minutes, when I'm done with my picture, picture everyone will know what God oh, looks like. Oh, that's fabulous. Well, of course, God doesn't look like anything. God is the spirit. God is the fourth. God is a creator. God is a, a maintainer. But God is the everything of the everything. So within God is everything we know, male and female. God's not a man. God's not a woman. God is a, a combination of all what we are, who we are, how we are. And actually, misunderstanding that has brought us great grief throughout the years. One of the greatest, if you will, one of the greatest contentions in the world since the beginning, and certainly since the so-called expulsion from Eden, is the tension between men and women. Yeah. And so Jung taught us what God has been teaching us. Jung taught us 100 years ago what God's been teaching us for thousands of years. And that is within us, within each and every one of us, is an image of God, which has both me, male and female. And what we're learning now is that men need to get in touch with their, their femininity and feel compassion. And women need to get in touch with their masculinity and feel strength. Very well said. I, I remember when I had given birth to one of my children, I was in the hospital and one of the nurses had come in late at night and I was laying with, with my baby. And she said to me, she goes, you know, when you look at these babies, you see God. Mm. And I always remembered that because it was very powerful. I'm not a particularly religious person. I have a strong spiritual practice of my own creation, but I do believe that there is, there is something. And I think that when we learn to 
see that godliness first in ourselves, right? If you can't see the pure preciousness in yourself, you cannot embrace that in the other. And we have to, when you say I'm not a religious person, that's fine because, you know, we created religions. Right. God didn't create religions. And religion, the creation of religion is just about a particular place or time or ethnicity or culture or social mores. Uh, God um, is God says to us, I'm the parent of you all. And just like in any family, somebody may say daddy and somebody may say pop and somebody may, may say mama and somebody say mommy. I don't care what you call me. You can call me anything, nor do I care the way you approach me, approach me in, in joyous singing, approach me in silence, approach me uh, gaily decorating the pathway or uh, austerely walking. It doesn't matter. Uh you are all my children. I love you all. You, I don't play favorites. And however you call me, however you approach me, is the spiritual path. Because ultimately, a spiritual path is not a particular religious or faith community. A spiritual path has two very simple places. It begins from God, and it continues until we return to God. I want to ask you a question about the 5D world. Because in the earlier segment, you had spoken about the shift from the 3D world to the 5D world. And mm -hmm. many of our listeners might not know what that is, myself included. 5D is Eden on Earth once again. It's that simple. 5D is a world of oneness, of oneness consciousness, of uh, love and respect and compassion and kindness and grace and generosity of spirit. That's the world to which we are moving and the world of uh, hatred and bigotry and discrimination and war is falling bit by bit, a little bit by a little bit. And then once again, you'll call me silly and idealistic and naive. So I would just call your attention. You remember back to 1987 to what we called the harmonic convergence? Yes, I do. <laughs> so we were all still, I, we were all still young and naive. And we decided that we would hold hands, stand around the whole world, hold hands, sing songs and bring peace. And the world just laughed at us. But, you know, within two years of that harmonic convergence, the Soviet Union fell, the satellite countries fell, the Berlin Wall came down, blacks and whites started riding the bus together in Johannesburg, Protestant and Catholics started shooting each other in Northern Ireland, and once in a while, Israelis and Arabs sat down at a peace table. Now, did we do that? Probably not. But what we did do is we sent the love vibration out to the world. You know, if I send the vibration of, he, he, of hate or fear out to the world, that's what will spiral around and come back to me. But if I send the love of, uh, vibration of love out to the world, that's what will spiral and come back. And if it comes back to me, we have the good hope that it's going to enter other people's hearts as well. Because we're told, it's metaphoric, of course, but the seraphim who surround the heavenly throne in the metaphoric heaven uh, what do they do all day? They just chant, holy, 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 sanctus, 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 uh, kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. And that sends the love vibration to us. We catch it and spiral the love vibration around the world and back to the heavens. That's how we move forward. And this is this is radical loving in action. And this is this is your point that when we're able to do that, we're, we're practicing this radical loving. It's for the, the greater good, the highest good and the best yield for all. Exactly. And so, you know, I wrote this book as aspirational. Here's what can happen. And then we were smacked with the reality of COVID. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the, the issues of aspiration became issues of daily survival. Do I care only for myself and my little family? Uh, do I say I want to open my business, my pizza parlor or my dry cleaning store, my nail salon, because I, I want to feed my family? Or do I want to, the businesses to open so I can go to a bar and drink and go to the beach and get a suntan? The, common, the, the, the individual good or, knee, uh, or, or uh, uh, versus the common good, the greatest good, the highest good. And we have been faced with that right now. And the people, the, the vaccination issue is exactly the same. Do I get vaccinated to protect myself and the people around me? Or do I, does my, quote, individual right and freedom uh, supersede and I can do whatever I want, even though it might be dangerous to myself and dangerous to those around me? You know, I, I, I must say, I don't understand people who choose not to be vaccinated. They choose to stop at red lights. 
to regulate society. <laughs> I don't understand why we don't vaccinate to regulate society. <laughs> That's a, that is a perfect endpoint. <laughs> To learn more about Rabbi Wayne Dosick, please go to ElijahMinion.com slash Rabbi hyphen Wayne. The book we've been talking about today is Radical Loving, One God, One World, One People. Rabbi Wayne, you come and hang out with me anytime to talk about God and anything else, because this is such good fun for me. <laughs> Thank you so much. And and as I say, you know, I'm interviewed in a lot of places and I do a lot of interviewing. You ask great questions. This was a wonderful Wonderful interview for me. Thank you. We'll be right back. And that is an absolute promise. One second here. Before we take that little break, let's talk about how to take the hassle out of healthcare. Prioritizing our health is an important part of personal responsibility and is a part of human happiness. When you need a good doctor, you generally need one right away, not days, weeks, or months from now. And when you need to see an MD ASAP, we've got a solution. Just download the free ZocDoc app, the easiest way to find a great doctor and instantly book an appointment. With ZocDoc, you can resource and compare doctors, verified patient reviews, and even book an appointment. Never wait on hold for a receptionist or get lost in voicemail hell again. ZocDoc takes the pain out of finding and scheduling a doctor. Whether you need a primary care physician, dentist, dermatologist, eye doctor, or any other medical specialist, ZocDoc has got you covered. The other day, I had terrible foot pain after a hike. I hopped on ZocDoc and found a podiatrist who could see me right away and accepted my insurance. So head on over to ZocDoc.com slash happiness and download the ZocDoc app for free. Join me and millions of other happy patients who use ZocDoc each month to find and book great doctors. ZocDoc helps us take control of our schedules and our health care at the same time. Now is the time to prioritize your health. Go to ZocDoc.com doc.com slash happiness and download the ZocDoc app to sign up for free and book a top rated doctor. Many are available as soon as today. That's zocdoc.com slash happiness. Now let's take that brief pause. Did you know that happiness is actually good for your health? Happy people live longer, are more productive, and make better partners, parents, and professionals. Connect with us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness. And follow Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen for a daily dose of inspiration. Welcome back. We're continuing the conversation about redefining spiritual practices for skeptics and seekers. We're talking about ethics, evolution, and the divine. My next guest is Jan Phillips. She is a visionary thought leader, award-winning author, and dynamic speaker. Jan is the co-founder and executive director of the Living Kindness Foundation, blending East and West, art and activism, reflection and ritual. Jan's presentations are transformative, uplifting and soul stirring. And she's also the author of several books, but the one we're talking about today is Still on Fire, Field Notes from a Queer Mystic. Welcome, Jan. Thanks for joining me on the show today. Hey, thanks for inviting me. Glad oh, well, this is, this is going to be good fun. First of all, I love the title of this book. It just, it makes me smile from ear to ear. It's good fun, but with a lot of meaning, I believe, behind it. Yeah. Talk about what it means First of all, to be a queer mystic, you know, maybe just define mystic. You can even leave out the queer. It doesn't matter. Mystic is a person who has an unmediated relationship with what we might consider supreme intelligence, divinity, God, how people are defining that in many different ways. But it's it's just an intimate, profound relationship with the other side, the invisible forces, and needs no priest, rabbi, or minister to officiate. Thank you. That is perfect. I mean, it's so beautiful. And one of the things that I get from the title, being still on fire, that in my view, as a, a woman of a certain age, that the idea of maturation and ripening to me, means that those powers become stronger, more crystallized, and more usable. Definitely. That's <laughs> the advantage of age. Yes, me too. 
Me too. It's a good thing. Talk a little bit about the book and what brought you to write this particular one, because you've written several books. Yes, all the other books have been nonfiction, straightforward writing, kind of connecting the dots between creativity, spiritual intelligence, and social action. So that's been my bailiwick for my entire career. I started as a social justice activist, but then after making a trip around the world, wrote a book about that experience. So I became a writer kind of by default, by accident, you might say. So this book is the first memoir, which seemed to me important to write because now I'm harvesting my experience. I'm I'm 72. And I'm looking still through the eyes of an activist. So it became an opportunity for me to, you know, we're pretty much a show, show, don't tell as an artist. You try to show, don't tell. And I thought, well, I could show people through the story of my own personal trajectory. How does one survive being kind of religiously brainwashed as a Catholic? How does one get disentangled from all the wrong teachings that we've absorbed and inherited and become her own authority? And I'm totally a spiritual authority now, and I speak with a forcefulness. I speak with the soul force because I trust who I am and what I am. And so this story reflects the journey of a young queer kid who was traumatized at age 12 to discover in the early phases of puberty that I was homosexual, which for a little Catholic kid is the worst finding you could ever discover about yourself. So I became suicidal. Just get rid of me because there's no one in the world who loves a homosexual. This was in the early 60s. And a Catholic nun saved my life. And for that reason, I decided to become a nun. And I only lasted two years because they discovered, of course, that I was gay and had to get rid of me. A rejection that was the worst ever of my life. So it took me 20 years to get over. And I thought writing this memoir would be an op and calling it, you know, Field Notes from a Queer Mystic would be a sing a signal to both people interested in mysticism and the LGBTQ community to know that this is the experience of a person who speaks with authority about how did I get here from being a suicidal Catholic queer kid. And the story is pretty compelling, but that's why I wrote it, because I wanted I wanted to be a strong force for LGBT, you know, what it's LGBT teens are four times more apt to commit suicide than little straight kids. Yeah. And so, you know, it's an act of social justice for me to do this work. Well, and it's, it's an act of love. It's an act of, you know, creative, creative juice. That's for sure. You know, at first it's no small task to write a book. And then when you're writing a book, you know, speaking of your own personal experiences that were not exactly joyful when you were a young person, it's quite courageous and, and helpful to others. Yeah. Well, the good news in there is that, we become masters because of the turbulence in our lives that we're able to process and harvest and ultimately say thank you for. So I didn't, I'm not aspiring to have a non-turbulent life, right? And so I think that people who have had the most significant suffering in their lives have an opportunity to become the most consequential teachers. I think you hit on something really important about the expectation of uh, to not have a non-turbulent life. You know, so many of us approach this life journey with the idea that we shouldn't, you know, that I shouldn't have to suffer or I shouldn't have to go through difficult times. And yet it is probably one of the only times where we really grow and expand is through those difficulties. Right. And the curious thing is that when you really get into the 
act of processing it and harvesting and managing the struggles in your life, what we discover is that they happened through us that we co we help to co-create all those events and they also happened for us. Yeah. It's like our soul invites big adventure. And the soul doesn't have the duality called good and bad. The soul just says big adventure. But the body, when we experience big adventure, it's usually traumatic. At least to start, you know. (laughs) (laughs) It often starts good, like a good marriage, but trauma enters into it somehow. It's just a natural, it's like the seasons where it's like tornadoes and hurricanes and floods. And that's how the earth experiences or expresses turbulence. But for human beings, it's called relationships falling apart. Yeah. Uh, And I think there is a strong message to us all in the book about this, you know, and about our relationship with whatever each of us calls it, you know, um, source, higher power, God, the divine, universal Mm -hmm. life force, whatever names we assign to that. Yes. Talk about your own spiritual journey through this, because you started out as a, a, a Catholic girl. You spent time in the convent, after which you were expelled, I guess, right? When, yeah. when it was discovered you were gay. And, yeah. and then it sounds like there was an, a, a continued odyssey. You talked about your travels around the world, and I would love for you to share with our audience how you did that, because it's, it's kind of bad bleep. Okay. All <laughs> right. Good. So yeah, the trajectory of the spiritual path was, even though I was dismissed from the convent, I still, I moved to California from upstate New York, and I went to the Catholic parish in my neighborhood and started to uh, teach kids guitar and initiate folk masses in the parish. But the priest found out that I was gay, and he told me that he wouldn't give me absolution. I couldn't receive the sacraments, and he didn't want to see me. Um in a church anymore, if, unless I promise to live a non-gay life, which of course I'm, I cannot do. So that was the end of religion for me. And then, and that was in the early 1971. So from then on, I had no religion, but a deep, I'm, you know, once you're a Catholic, you're always a Catholic. So that appreciation for ritual and ceremony, and I experimented with well, not experimented with because I wasn't looking for a replacement, but I did as part of being part of the women's movement, got involved with with the Wiccan movement and really appreciated their nature based rituals. But it just I don't know, nothing was a good fit for me because I think my calling was to be greater than all the traditions, you know, to meld the traditions And so it's no surprise that I was led to making a peace pilgrimage around the world, led by reading the book, The Hundredth Monkey, which we don't have time to go into here, but it's a short little book that landed on my workbench when I was a picture framer. I read it on my lunch hour and I was so transformed by it that I went across the street to the bank, gave 20 bucks to the teller and said, I'm going to go on a peace pilgrimage around the world as soon as I get $5,000 in the bank. And so I took on a few extra jobs, painted houses, waitress, did four different jobs, exhausted myself. But within a year and a half, I had saved $5,000. I bought, I'm a photographer, you know, and so I bought 200 rolls of film, 200 <laughs> Kodak mailers, and left with a huge backpack, all my camera gear, and I had a slideshow on the peace movement in the U.S. and Canada and a slideshow on the women's movement. And my job was to show that slide, those slideshows to as many people as I could. I lasted a year, 
I interacted with thousands of people, showed my slides in 20 countries, and I myself was the transformed one. Hmm. So when it, by the time I came home, I remember flying home, looking down at the airport in Syracuse, New York, and I thought, oh, my God, even Christianity's too small for me now. What will become of me? Because Christians say, you know, you can't get to heaven unless you're a Christian. So it's just bonkers, right? It's ridiculous religious undoing of what Jesus really stood for. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we will continue the conversation with Jan Phillips. We're talking about Still on Fire, Field Notes from a Queer Mystic. To learn more about Jan and her work, please visit janphillips.com on Twitter at the. The, and that's T H E E, Jan Phillips, on Facebook, San Diego. Here comes the pause. We'll be right back. And that is a promise. Who says money can't buy happiness? Whether you are a skeptic or seeker, check out Lisa's new book, Are We Happy Yet? Eight Keys to Unlocking a Joyful Life, a boot camp manual for greater emotional fitness, is available at Barnes and Noble, Amazon, IndieBound, and HarvestingHappiness.com. Here's a truth bomb. Emotions are contagious, and happiness is a universally desired state. But we tend to forget that we all have the freedom to be happy or the liberty to be miserable each day, regardless of external circumstances. Explore the journey of human happiness, how to find it and keep it, with Lisa's documentary film, H Factor. Where is your heart? Visit HarvestingHappiness.com to learn more. Welcome back. We're continuing the conversation with Jan Phillips. We're talking about spiritual practice for skeptics and seekers, contemplating ethics, evolution, and the divine. Let's get back to it. Jan, I rudely interrupted you because we had to go to break, but now the floor is yours. Take it away. All right. So I was talking about the transformation in me after being on the road. Like three months in India changes person hugely you know, a month in the Himalayas. So all the experiences I had caused me to come home, a different person who started out on that journey. And I, I didn't, I didn't have the words for it, but I knew that I wasn't going to take up my life as a social activist that I had been living. I was going to, I moved out to the North country in New York and lived as a spiritual contemplative, worked part-time as a photojournalist for a weekly publication, but had a lot of time to try and figure out what the heck had happened to me as a result (laughs) of that experience. And I decided I needed to write a book because as an extrovert, many of us don't know what we're thinking until we hear ourselves express it. So I said, I got to figure out. So I wrote a book that was just a chronological account of Japan, China, Thailand, Hong Kong, right? And all the every month or every location was a different chapter. And then by the time I had written that book, which my it was my first serious writing project, I knew what had happened to me and I could sort it out and and claim my power in the matter. And so once I wrote that book, then I was invited to teach at a a women's writers conference and realized that all these women's voices were silenced because they lacked the confidence that their work mattered. And so then I I started um, teaching and that really teaching women writers. And that began my the career of my lifetime which has been to work with women on their creativity and their spiritual authority. I love that you keep coming back to the word authority. And then I love the pairing of it with spirituality, the spiritual authority, because to me, that is, it's something very impactful and it makes one stand up tall. And I think that's what you're communicating here to that we, that we come home, the journey of coming home to ourselves. Coming home to ourselves. That's exactly it. It's a beautiful phrase. 
And we're not taught that, you know, I don't think we learn that in our families of origin, right? We're taught to conform or be domesticated. And it is the journey, you know, the journey that you describe in your book, Still on Fire, that brings us to that destination. I know. And I don't, I run into women all the time, people who say, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. And I'm, it's so curious to me because I don't have an experience of fear that I can nail down. And I, I end up feeling like it's an old voice. It's habit talk, right? And if we really go down into it, it's not that they're afraid. It's something else that's stopping them. Because once we, I mean, I think having a spiritual practice, you mentioned this at the beginning, and I must say, I began a spiritual practice in 1990, which was the beginning of my healing, because I had from, I had 20 years of not being healed, because I didn't have a spiritual practice that grounded me. And it doesn't mean, it's not woo-woo, it's, does, it's not airy-fairy, it just means you make a commitment, you sit down in silence for whatever time you can. I started out with 20 minutes because a close friend of mine who I trust, who I call my spiritual guru, she said, Jan, your life can never work out if you don't have a practice that you're true to. So that's what I think is the minimum daily required thing for all of us is to be willing to sit in silence for at least 10 minutes every day of our lives. What you describe to me sounds like you're suggesting this. It's like tending, you know, tending to the garden, pulling, pulling yeah. weeds, watering, fertilizing. Yes. And that's very, it's very quiet work. It's very quiet and gardening involves a lot of activity. Tending involves a lot of activity. But in my experience, the practice is more stillness and receptivity. So we, it's like training your ears to training your mouth to not move and your ears to open up. So that we, you know, Emily Dickinson said, the only news I get is bulletins all day from immortality. You know, she wrote <laughs> thousands of poems, but we're like satellite dishes to divine mind. And divine mind is broadcasting intelligence every day, all the time throughout the cosmos. And as satellite dishes, we receive those. But if we're all the time talking and moaning and complaining about our lives, we don't get the essential message. But if in those 10 or 20 minutes and you're sitting there in silence saying, hello, I'm on the call, I'm hearing, I'm listening, that's how simple it is. You just announce to supreme intelligence that you're ready to get it and eventually things happen. I have two CDs of music, of songs that entered into me during my stillness time, once I settled into it. Most of the books I write, I get so much help with from the invisible forces. So that's your time of getting help and hearing messages from the great silent one. And let's circle back to the definition of mysticism for a moment, because you said the words, this is not woo woo. And this is something that we often talk about on this show, because it's easy to try and attach the woo woo <laughs> to what we're talking about here, but it's not woo woo. It actually is very uh, rational. Yeah. Because most times if you ask for people to say, what's the visual when I say the word mysticism? For a lot of people, it's like Teresa of Avila, Catherine of Siena, in their little cell, in their little monastery, you know, weeping and wailing because they're having, you know, inexplicable experiences. And they write about it in their books, but that's from the Middle Ages. And we have evolved you know, how many, 
hundreds of years later, is it? And so mysticism in 2021 doesn't look anything like the mysticism that are in all the books you read up from the mystics. Yeah. But there's modern day mystics. You know, everything didn't ha- stop. Prophets didn't stop with Isaiah. You know, we're the prophets of these times. So m- mysticism is should not be confused with the old. Mysticism is the new. And there's an exodus movement of people leaving the churches because our churches have so little integrity anymore. They're so doomed to fail because they still discriminate against queers and they disc- and their race. I mean, there's so many problems with traditional churches. So we're kind of being evolutionarily forced into creating our own spiritual traditions. And for each person, I would call that their mystic journey. Mm. And what a lovely adventure to embark upon. You know, the, the great mystic journey, the coming home to the self. You know, some would call it, you know, the the heroic journey. I mean, Joseph Campbell's world, I know that there are mm. other interpretations of this as well. But each one of us is challenged to find this within ourselves. Yeah, because you know what? The real thing is we're here for joy. And if I, and I live a daily life where I wake up happy and I'm pretty joyful through the day and I don't ever chastise myself for being wrong or stupid or any of those things, because I know I'm a living emanation of divinity itself. And I do my best and I make mistakes and I have anxiety attacks and I'm subject to the same forces everyone else is subject to. <laughs> but I, I make the I try to make the best of it. And when I list in, I, I'm in a book club and women are all the time talking about how they're not right as they are. You know, they're always striving. You know, my next book is going to be called Stop Seeking, Start Finding. Because, you know, when you're seeking, if you're hard on yourself, if you don't think it's right in front of your eyes, if you don't think that same divine force is in your own lungs and in your own bloodstream, then you're, you're not doing it right. You're forgetting things. And that's because we've been exposed to so many bad ideas. But the great mystic, Meister Eckhart, said the process of enlightenment is a process of subtraction, not addition. So that means if you get rid of all your bad ideas, you'll see that you are enlightened because you're a chunk of God. Oh, I love that chunk of God. And boy, we do have a lot of bad ideas. We, and you know, there's a saying like, we shouldn't believe every, everything we think, you know, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, 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 I believe that to be true. I have experienced that, you know, where, where, I, where I'm thinking, what, what are you thinking that for? That's just right. a irrational belief, not productive and stop it. Inherited. Knock it off. <laughs> yeah. Knock it off. Not your own thoughts. Yes, exactly. Well, Jan Phillips, you are still on fire. And I I love the title of this book and and, um, it's a great read. So check it out, listeners. Still on fire, field notes from a queer mystic. My guest today has been Jan Phillips. To learn more about Jan and her work, please visit janphillips.com. On Twitter at the, and that's with T-H-E-E, Jan Phillips. And on Facebook, San Diego. Jan, thanks for joining me for part of your day. I, I love this. Hey, thanks so much. It's been great. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness this week. This is Lisa Cypers Kamen, and on behalf of my guests, Rabbi Wayne Dosick and Jan Phillips, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Please go out and rock your day, and remember to be kind to one another. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime and anywhere. From the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes via our free app or from our libraries at toginet.com, iTunes, Google Play, and other fine podcast platforms. To learn more about Lisa's global consulting services, please visit harvestinghappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness is produced in collaboration with Toginet Radio. KBUU Radio Malibu.net and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange.